The last 15 months was about more than the pandemic. It was about more than a virus. Something happened to us over the last 15 months. And for a lot of us, it wasn't good. If there's one thing that I've heard over and over again from people, a phrase that has been startling how many times I've heard it from so many different lips, uh, people saying, I'm not in a good place. I'm, I'm just not in a good place right now. And if you push on what that means, and all, you know, all kinds of things come out. There's all different kinds of bad places. Uh, they may be having anxiety about reentering a workforce, a working world. Their, their marriage didn't survive or doesn't look like it's going to. At the very least, it needs some serious work. Uh, some will say their kids went south. Uh, either distance learning or separation from their friends brought out all kinds of issues and conflicts. Uh, a lot of addictions developed during this time, or at least dependencies on everything from porn to pills. Many dealt and are dealing with deep depression. Relationships suffered. Friends and family, people we loved and did life with on the front end of this, ended up as casualties because we fell on differing sides of issues or lifestyle choices. Collectively, we also seemed to just fall to our most base instincts. We gave in to selfishness. Uh, what started with hoarding toilet paper uh, became a full-blown, self-serving, me-against-the-world kind of mentality. We stopped caring about other people uh, and only cared about ourselves. We got mean-spirited. Road rage is up. Fights in stores, up. Fights on airplanes, skyrocketing. Whether online or in person, it's as if we have given ourselves over to unchecked rage. And of course, spiritually, I haven't run into too many people who would say that this was just this fantastic time of growth in their relationship with God. You know, I have so much more intimacy with him now. I don't hear that as much as uh, instead of feasting on scriptures and spending time in prayer, people were feasting on their news feeds and spent time battling others online. And that just made things worse. So here we are at the end, and it's done a number on us. So what will it take for COVID and all that it's done for our lives and our community life to be put behind us. Well, what if everything that is ending, everything that we have been waiting to end, are metaphors of what we really need to do to bring this to an end? What if taking off our masks is absolutely what we need to do, but it's not about cloth? What if ending social distancing uh, is absolutely what we need to do, but it has nothing to do with six feet of distance? What if no longer hoarding is something we don't have to do anymore, but it has nothing to do with toilet paper? Well, that's what this series is going to be about. How do we take this long night's journey we've been in and truly bring it into a new day? And to do that and to take that journey, we're going to be looking at the five biblical keys to putting the last 15 months firmly behind us. And there really are five biblical keys, and we need them. You need them, I need them. So let's just jump into the first one. And I've already kind of mentioned it. Uh, we're told that we can stop social distancing. So let's stop social distancing. And as mentioned, I'm not talking about six physical feet. I'm talking about the social distancing that took place over the last 15 months that drove us apart from each other. Even those of us bound through the love and life of Jesus. Let's be honest about what has happened between Christians. And I think that uh, Timothy Dalrymple, president of Christianity Today, put it as succinctly as anybody. He said, one group within American evangelicalism believes our religious liberties have never been more firmly established. Another, that they've never been at greater risk. One group believes racism is still systemic in American society. Another, that the systemic racism push is a progressive program to redistribute wealth and power to angry radicals. One is more concerned with the insurrection at the Capitol, another with the riots that followed the killing of George Floyd. One believes the Trump presidency was generationally damaging to Christian witness, another that it was enormously beneficial. One believes the former president attempted a coup, another that the Democrats stole the election. One believes masks and vaccines are marks of Christian love, another that the rejection of the same is a mark of Christian courage. But it's not just that those were divides. They were divides that we elevated above 
anything and everything that used to bind us together as Christ followers. We let them become incredibly deeply embedded wedges between us, so much so that we let them end relationships. Relationships with friends, relationships with family, relationships with churches. So what does the Bible have to offer us? What would God say to us at this moment in our lives, the end of the 15 months, finally seeing you know the end, what would it say to us about really putting this part of it behind us? Well, a lot. Because not surprisingly, allowing disagreements to take hold and end in relational breakdown is not unique to our day. They've plagued us throughout time. The Bible talks openly about it and records things. In fact, let me take you to one recorded incident uh, that was recorded, I find, unflinchingly <laughs> in the Bible between some of the most celebrated and godly of Christian leaders. Here's the background story. It involves a man by the name of Paul who was a leader of the church appointed by Jesus himself and a younger apprentice in the early Christian movement named John Mark, uh, often just called Mark. Together they were part of what is known as the first great missionary team journey. It was a team that was sent out by the lead church in Jerusalem in order to travel throughout various cities to plant churches and strengthen the Christian movement. But before that journey was completed, Mark left them and he went home to Jerusalem. He did not see the mission through to the end. We don't know why he left. Uh, he could have been homesick. It could have been because they had experienced a change of plans and decided to add a, a city or two, and he may have felt like they'd already done enough. And uh, We know there was a change of leadership from a man named Barnabas to, uh, and, and Mark was very close to Barnabas, to Paul, and uh, he didn't know Paul as well. But we don't know that that was it. We just don't know what happened. All we know is that before the journey had been completed, Mark left the team and went home. But we do know how Paul felt about what Mark did. Uh, he, he, he was so angry, frustrated, and done. He felt that Mark uh, had just let them all down. Uh, so much so that later, when Barnabas suggested that they invite Mark along for a second journey that they were planning, Paul would have none of it. Here's how it's recorded for us in the Bible, in the New Testament book of Acts, which is called Acts simply because it records the Acts of the early church. Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, but Paul chose Silas. You don't have to read too much between the lines on that one. They broke up over a difference of opinion on Mark. In essence, Paul said, if Mark is in this, I'm out. Barnabas said, if Mark isn't in this, I'll be out. So Barnabas took Mark and did his thing, and Paul took another man named Silas and did his thing. For Paul, Mark was such a, a, a hot-button issue that he couldn't get over it. He, he just couldn't get past it. For, for Paul, Mark did something or stood for something that he just couldn't navigate. He couldn't be part of anything Mark was a part of. That's strong. Uh, but there are some issues that we have elevated to a deal-breaking status. Whether or not to wear masks, whether or not to be open or closed, whether or not to get vaccinated, whether or not we should advocate for vaccinations. So maybe just imagine Paul being a, a pro-mask-wearing, clothes in-person services, get vaccinated out of love for others guy, and Mark, this virus downplaying, let's keep meeting, uh, I'll get a vaccination when hell freezes over guy. Doesn't matter who is right or wrong. They allowed it to become this deeply relational divide. So what happened to Mark? Well, it turns out that Barnabas giving him a second chance was a good call, at least for the, uh, the kingdom, <laughs> at least for the cause of Christ. Mark not only continued to work for the strength and growth of the early church, he even wrote uh, one of the four biographies of Jesus contained in the Bible. If you've heard of the four biographies, also called the Gospels, which simply means good news, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, named after the men who wrote them, that's the Mark we're talking about. But no matter what Mark did later, was that still the end of the relationship between him and Paul? With the divide that they had over that first missionary journey and whatever happened, 
Would that ever be uh, healed? Would that be the last word? Well, we know. Years later, toward the end of Paul's life, the Bible records an interesting little event. Uh, in one of two letters that Paul wrote to a younger leader he was mentoring by the name of Timothy, he, he said this at the end, almost like a throwaway line, that if you didn't know the earlier story, you wouldn't know the significance of this. But he had this little throwaway line at the end of his letter to Timothy. He said, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Paul asked Timothy to bring Mark with him because Paul valued what he brought to his life's work. A complete turnaround from where they had been. Instead of excluding him, he's including him. Instead of evaluating him as a liability, he's now seen as a priceless asset. Whatever Mark did, whatever divide they had, it was no longer relevant. It was no longer a divide. So what happened? Obviously, two things. First, through the lens of time, Paul and Mark obviously came to see that what divided them in the past became meaningless as the days went by. At the time, it seemed like everything, <laughs> but in truth, it wasn't. The more time passed, the less things that divided them mattered. And won't that be the case for many of us? I mean, tell me truthfully. I, I've thought about this. You probably have too. In 10 years, will whether one person got vaccinated or another didn't, or whether one person advocated for vaccines and another didn't, matter? Really, will that matter 10 years from now? Will we really see that as the basis for a breaking off of relationship and community? For the loss of someone in your life that you were close to and even loved? I mean, in terms of Jesus and the mission we are called to collectively pursue during this short span of time on earth, is it going to matter? See, I don't think so. Uh, what was inflamed and enlarged over the last 15 months will be trivialized over time. But that's not all that obviously happened between Paul and Barnabas. There was a second, far more powerful and significant thing that kicked in. There was a return to the practice and the embrace of grace. The grace given to us so freely and undeserved from Jesus that was then meant to be passed on so freely to others. Let's remember what grace is. Grace at its heart is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do. Let me say that again. Grace at its heart is getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do. It's something that we receive that we don't earn. And not only is grace at the heart of the Christian faith, it's meant to be at the heart of the Christian life. Um, you know, we like to talk about grace. We like to be on the receiving end of grace. But if it's going to be part of the Christian life, it's got to be something that it's dispensed by us. It's the giving of grace, being on the giving end where it gets tricky. But if grace is going to be a part of your life, it's not just going to be receiving it. It's going to be giving it. I was reading this past week something I'd read a long time ago, but uh, reread it this week about the woman who founded the American Red Cross. She was a woman named Clara Barton, a fascinating woman. And a friend of hers once reminded her of uh, an especially cruel thing that had happened to her many years before. And Clara didn't seem to recall it. Her friend pouted, what do you mean you don't recall it? You, you remember that. It was just da 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 And then here's what Barton said. No, she said, I distinctly remember forgetting it. That's the dispense of grace. Think about what our Paul Mark issues have been over the last 15 months. Hasn't the heart of them just been just raw disagreements? Just disagreeing with each other. And our natural default mode when it comes to others is simple. You should be like me. And over the last 15 months, it's also been expanded to you should think like me. You should feel like me. You should vote like me. You should respond to current events like me. You should get the news feeds that I get like me. You should make the choices that I'm making. You should be following the lifestyle I'm living. If not, you're wrong. Uh, you're extreme. You're bad. And then we critique and condemn how and when and where they were different from us. So how does grace change that dynamic if allowed to enter in and really be practiced? Grace says, something that we say a lot around here. Grace says, you know what? We're going to agree to disagree agreeably. Pick your topic. 
Vaccines, masks, COVID statistics, closings, Fauci, <laughs> people divided on everything. Grace would step in and would say, you know what, I disagree with you on that, but there's no way something as ultimately historically almost trivial or superficial as this is going to undermine our relationship. I know I may have gotten heated about it a time or two early on when we talked, but I am so sorry for that. We disagree, but I love you. No matter which of us is right or wrong, we are both so sin-stained and sin-soaked and in need of grace from God, all we really can do is fall into each other's arms and weep with joy at our mutual salvation and that we can be brothers and sisters. Really, wouldn't that just be the way forward? And even a year from now, are we going to really feel like any of this was substantive enough to end a relationship? Separate from a friend, become estranged from a daughter, decide to leave a community of faith that's been your family for years. I've got a theory I want to float out. It's that one of the things grace does when it's applied is that it diffuses things, just diffuses it. And what the lack of grace does is inflame things, make small things bigger and small emotions hotter. And it's Satan who despises grace and its saving work more than anything, wants to eradicate grace from human experience as much as possible while simultaneously fanning every flame of ungrace that he can. And when grace, though, is running fast and free, he can't. It frustrates him. So the first key to putting the last 15 months behind us is to stop social distancing. Not in terms of six feet, but in terms of the divides and the divisions and the relational breakdowns fueled by a lack of grace. Stop social distancing by getting on the dispensing side of grace. Uh, you know, go after the broken, strained relationships and just apply copious amounts of healing grace. You say, but they did that or they said that. That's what grace is for. Wrong's done. To you, by you between us? I know that might not be easy, but I guarantee you not only will God show up when you exercise grace toward others, he'll help you give it out. 